Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching the Today I Found Our YouTube channel. And in the video today, we're looking at what powers the Queen of England actually has. And just before you get started, I do want to say that this video is brought to you by TunnelBear. TunnelBear is a simple privacy app that makes it easy to enjoy a more open internet. It's available for iOS, Android, Windows, and Mac. Start your free trial today at tunnelbear.com forward slash brain food. So a short while ago, we put out a video about the fact that Queen Elizabeth II neither needs a passport nor a driving license thanks to a quirk of British law. But what other powers does the Queen of Many Titles have, and what could she theoretically do if she decided to flex the full might of the authority that she wields? As it turns out, thanks to the royal prerogative, a terrifying amount, if she really felt like it, or at least that's assuming Parliament went by the letter of the law and that the people didn't decide to stage a small revolt. In reality, the Queen rarely exerts even a fraction of the power that she theoretically wields, as it's kept in check by the only person in the UK who can tell her what to do, and that's herself. This is very much a calculated move on her part in order to stay in the good graces of her subjects. She also voluntarily pays her taxes, even though she's not technically obligated to, and that helps with people's opinion of her. Not only does she avoid openly flexing her political might, she also tends to keep her opinions outside of the public sphere. As historian Frank Prohaska notes, the real secret of royal influence is saying nothing. And anything the Queen does say publicly is pretty anodyne. The minute a monarch or many of the royals say anything remotely political or opinionated, they alienate people and they lose some power. This silence played a large part in how the British monarchy survived post-World War I when other European royal families didn't. In fact, for nearly two decades now, the monarchy has regularly had polls run and focus groups put together to keep track of how the general public feels about them and their various actions. They also have on payroll individuals whose job it is to ensure the Queen stays in the public eye and in a way that is most likely to endear her to her subjects. Similar to politicians who rely on the voting public, with each public change she presents, right down to the carrying of a cell phone or not, carefully calculated in terms of the impact it might have. While this may seem only self-serving, the Queen has a very lengthy track record as an admirable public servant and is also acutely aware that she is a prominent public face representing her subjects, so is keen on avoiding being viewed in a bad light, lest she in turn paints them in a bad light by her actions. As she noted at the tender age of 21 in a speech to the Commonwealth she gave on her birthday, I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and the service of our great imperial family, to which we all belong. Surprisingly, for many years the full extent of exactly what powers the Queen handed off to the government, but technically retained, weren't publicly known. That is, until 2003, when the government released a partial list of the things it can do on the Queen's behalf. For the most part, the list confirms that the government could do things to save the Queen time, such as issue or revoke passports which simply wouldn't be a feasible thing to be the sole prerogative of the crown in a modern society. However, some were actually slightly worried by some of the things she could do, like declare war, which under rules of royal prerogative can be done without consulting parliament. On top of that, the queen is totally immune from prosecution and is considered above the law in the UK. And further, as a head of state, she also enjoys diplomatic immunity in any foreign country she happens to visit. As such, she could commit any crime conceivable anywhere on earth, at least as the law currently stands and suffer no legal consequences for doing so. However, as with everything else, she's generally exceptionally careful to ensure that she doesn't break any laws. Of course, what she does in private is completely her own affair, despite her prominent political position, as she is exempt from freedom of information requests. So, moving on, because technically speaking, the people of Britain are not citizens but subjects of the monarch, she could have anyone she wanted arrested and presumably seize their property or land for the crown. Speaking of which, the Queen owns all of the seabeds around the UK and can commandeer any ship found in British waters for service to the realm. Oddly enough, she also has first dibs on any whales that wash up on shore. The Queen could also administer any manner of punishment to an individual who offended or otherwise displeased her, as the Crown has prerogative power to keep the peace within the realm. And since she's immune from prosecution, nobody could really do anything if this punishment wasn't entirely within the scope of the law. If the government tried to stop her, the Queen could decimate the British political landscape by dissolving Parliament and appointing anyone she felt like as Prime Minister. This is because it's the Queen's duty to appoint the Prime Minister and she could, in theory, appoint anyone she wanted to the position, regardless of the way the British public voted in an election. On top of that, in the event the Queen didn't like the outcome of an election, for instance, if she didn't like the
the replacement parliament members that were voted in, she could just call for another one using royal prerogative until she got the parliament she wanted. Not that she'd need to, because if she really wanted, she'd just bring in the army to keep everyone in line. But how does that work? How does she control the army? Well, that's because the Queen is also the commander-in-chief of the entire British military, with every officer, soldier, sailor, and pilot swearing allegiance to the crown and nobody else. They're not called Her Majesty's Armed Forces for nothing. Being considered the ultimate authority on all British military matters, the Queen could authorize a nuclear strike on France or make North Korea an ally, as she has the power to declare both war and peace with foreign nations. As for laws, while technically the Queen can't create new laws, she can only sign them into law after they've been decided upon by Parliament. In fact, her royal assent is required to make the law official after being passed by Parliament in the first place. She could appoint ministers who'd make any laws she wanted a reality and then just sign them into law that way. Beyond royal assent, there's also the the Queen's consent, which requires she give her consent before any law that affects the interests of the monarchy can even be discussed at all in Parliament. She actually has used this power before, such as in 1999 when she refused to allow the discussion of a bill that would have given Parliament power to authorize military strikes in Iraq instead of needing her authorization. So, well, that's all on the political side, but it doesn't stop here. The Queen technically has a sort of power not only over her subjects' physical beings, but also their souls. Well, how? Well, that's because she's also the head of the Church of England, including having the power to appoint archbishops and power over many other such matters concerning the Church. As for most of these powers that technically allow her to rule with an iron fist, as previously mentioned, the Queen is hesitant to ever use them in such a way that would displease her subjects, and certainly isn't about to disregard their representatives in Parliament. However, these powers still exist for a variety of reasons, including potentially being needed in times of extreme crisis. That said, just because she isn't in the practice of exercising her powers against the will of the people, it doesn't mean she isn't occasionally an active political powerhouse in private. Extremely well-respected and known worldwide with the ability to bend the ear of most heads of state, the influence the Queen wields is difficult to quantify, but, as noted in an article discussing why the BBC named the Queen the most powerful woman in the world in their list of 100 most powerful women, Her Majesty's power is more about influence. A discreet nod of the head, a polite word in the ear of a prime minister at their weekly meeting, or a strategic patronage of a cause being overlooked by the government, is how she can indirectly affect our world without us even knowing. Well, to conclude, the Queen has many powers she could theoretically legally use to her own ends unless her subjects and Parliament simply decided to stage a revolution. However, she generally avoids doing anything overt that might upset her subjects and otherwise simply works in the background, more or less in an advisory role when she feels there is a need. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. Now, if you are interested in protecting your privacy online, well, then you really should have a VPN. Now, VPNs are something you might have heard of. They are simple tools that have become a must for people who want to enjoy a more private and open internet experience. Now, there are a lot of reasons that people might want to do this. One thing that I've personally come across is when I'm booking a flight to somewhere and then you come back later and that flight is more expensive. Basically, they know you're coming back and they know you're actually more interested, so they think that they can charge you more money. A tool like a VPN helps you avoid that problem. Or maybe you're traveling or you live in a country with a less than open internet. That's uh, that's another thing that a VPN can be very useful for. Now, this is VPNs in general. And to be honest, there are plenty of providers around and they all promote different features that you might or you might not need. But TunnelBear are the best provider. They're actually a company that I've used for a long time before we even did this sponsorship with them. And to me, I like them because they do three things and they do them perfectly. The first one is that it's incredibly easy to use. Now, you'd kind of expect it to be easy to use on a Mac or a PC, but when it comes to phones and internet, it always seemed to get a little bit tricky with other experiences I've had. But with TunnelBear, you install it, you flick a switch, and it's uh, it's it's ready to go. It's really as simple as that. Even if you don't really have any technical skills, you can still get TunnelBear up and running. Second of all, it is super, super secure. It uses something called AES-256 encryption, which I didn't actually know what it was. I looked it up and it turns out that it can be broken. It can be broken if you've got access to the world's most powerful computer, and you can set that computer to run for a trillion times a trillion times a trillion times a trillion number of years. 
So no, it can't be broken. Number three, it's super fast. It's got servers in 20 countries, so wherever you are, you can get fast internet access through a nearby connection. And hey, if you want to try it out for yourself, see how fast, secure, and easy to use it is, you can take advantage of the free trial that TunnelBear have been kind enough to extend to you guys. You can just go to tunnelbear.com forward slash brain food to get a seven day free trial. There is also a link in the description below. And as always, thanks for watching.